come to prayer with me this day. Gracious God, we thank you for giving us your continued grace and love within our lives and your continued blessings as we follow your way. Allow us to follow the plan as we move forward in our lives and pray that you will come to each of us in our hearts and our souls this day as we hear your words. The words of wisdom and grace and love that provide the blessings upon us. I ask now that you would touch my lips of clay, mold them into the words that need to be spoken this day, and the words that come from my mouth, along with the meditations on each and every one of our hearts, be they ever acceptable to you. In Christ we pray. Amen. So, today throughout the world, Christians are celebrating this day of Pentecost. It is a day that the Christians call and mark the birthday of the Christian church. And today we heard about the beginnings of the church as we know it, where Peter finally steps up to the plate and does what Jesus was preparing him to do all along with the others to do the entire time. We heard that the disciples of receiving the gift and the gift that Jesus told them about was the gift of the Holy Spirit. And from all of this, we see Peter and the rest of the disciples move beyond their fear, even more beyond their role as students, along with moving beyond all the other things that they had said that were supposedly getting in the way. They were now in the hands and the feet within the world, that image and that body of Christ in the world going out into the world, delivering this powerful message. Our story begins, as we heard in the reading from Acts this morning, that the disciples were already gathered together. They were gathered together for that celebration of Pentecost, which in the Jewish festive time is set out in the Torah. And as we know, the Torah are the words and the law of our Jewish siblings, which make up those first five books of the Old Testament in the Bible. Pentecost was a celebration which takes place 50 days after Passover and was actually called the Feast of Weeks or Shavuot. And Shavuot or the Feast of the Weeks celebrates the first fruits of the early harvest bringing us into spring. So here we have the disciples who were gathered together for their traditional Jewish celebration which they had planned for and they had heard about and all of that. And Jesus tells them to wait in Jerusalem after he returned to be with God in order for them to receive this strange gift that was going to be sent down to them. And here we have the disciples along with probably 2,000 others all gathered for this Pentecost festival when suddenly the sound, the sound that was like a rush of a violent wind came before them filling this gathering place, this gathering place of worship. At this point, they were filled with the sensation of the Holy Spirit dividing their tongues with fire, and all of a sudden, as we heard, they began speaking the words of the gospel message. You might be thinking that there's nothing strange about that, but it made this so miraculous that they were all speaking the message and they were gathered in such a way that everyone could understand them. Now we have to remember here, people from all over the lands were gathered here in Jerusalem for the Feast of the Weeks. And all of these different people did not speak the same language, so these guys were now speaking the good news, and they were doing it in different languages, languages that the people could now understand. Some of these people were amazed with all of this because this time of going on, this ridiculing and being cynical actually was accusing the disciples for being drunk. But Peter stands and raises his voice to the crowds and tells them that they are not drunk, that they were speaking as the prophet spoke. He goes on to speak the different visions and powers that will come to all of them young and old, women and men, those in slavery and those who were free. Peter goes on to quote the prophet Joel, who we find in the Old Testament of what the Jewish siblings call the Torah. 
He quotes Joel by saying, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and that your sons and daughters shall prophesy and prophesy, and the young shall see visions, while those who are old will dream the dreams. Peter even goes on to say that upon the slaves, both men and women in those days, that he will pour out my spirit, and that they will prophesy and they will call the spirit just as they were given. But it was for them, and it was for everyone. Today, as Christians, we celebrate Pentecost, and our focus isn't on the feast of the original celebrations, but of the massive wind that swept through the land, which stirred on this celebration. However, was giving the Holy Spirit. You probably could say that Pentecost created what one might call the original authentic worship since everyone was now talking in tongues and at the same time not understanding those who weren't speaking the same language as they yet creating this uniqueness about themselves this uniqueness creating an authentic style of worship so here's the key God has always been interested in authenticity of each of us which also includes how we worship in our own authentic way and authentic is defined as something that is true and genuine and real. If you go into John's Gospel, right around chapter 4, maybe verses 23 or whatever, we hear that yet the hour is coming and is already here when real worshipers will worship the Abba God in spirit and truth. Indeed, it is just such worshipers who Abba seeks God is spirit and is the worship of God. We must worship in the spirit and truth. God is after that authentic worship and deserves nothing less in return. So the question then becomes, how do we live out an authentic worship? I think the answer lies in the Hebrew word for worship that translates into our daily living. And it's the same definition that Paul used when he wrote the letter to the Romans, where he said, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. You see, in the six days and 21 hours outside of a church service, that that's what makes authentic worship. Our songs are not the end all but that we bring to worship, but merely it is a physical expression of our hearts in our position. The nice thing about when we gather corporately as a body of Christ, we come in with a unique song of praise on our lips inspired by God's faithfulness from the past week that our songs can be that springboard into the next week and actually that propels our faith in what God has yet to do. Somebody recently asked me what my theology on worship was. And I think my theology on worship starts with this. Worship begins with the response to God and responding to God's revelation of who God is. And that moves us into that intimate place. One of my favorite verships, verses that talk about worship comes from Ephesians. And it says, Speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God for everything, and in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submit to one another out of the reverence for Christ. It then goes and talks about marriage relationships and says, Wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, serve your wives as Christ loves and gives up his life for the church. And then towards the end of the chapter we hear, For those reasons, a man will leave his father and mother and will unite with his wife, and the two will become flesh. In our cases, it could be a man unites with his husband and a wife and a woman unites with his wife as well. Somewhat of a profound mystery, but I'm also talking about the Christ and the Christ in the church. 
I'm talking about the Christ and the church that is that interesting thing that Paul begins to monologue about marriage with his conversations about worship. Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. There are many linguistics. Bible scholars that think that the word hymns comes from the word the word of the Greek used for that specific contest. And that specific word that is that context of a Greek wedding ceremony. So it's an idea that was that on the wedding day, all these folks would be running around singing these hymns and that God would hear their songs and come down and bless their wedding ceremony. It was a way to bless and assure that intimacy between the couple. So what Paul was doing here was taking a cultural metaphor and giving it a whole new context. He's talking about the way that we sing songs that we usually use to talk about intimacy between one another. But now we can use those same tools and those same songs to become more intimate and closer with our relationship with Christ. All relationships begin with an idea of response. And we ask the questions or ask questions that we respond to. That we get to know each other a little bit better. So for example, if you meet somebody for the first time, you might ask questions like, where are you from? Or what do you do for a living? Worship also begins at a place of response. It is as we understand God's revelation is our lives more and more. We can't help but respond with a passion of praise and humble worship because we know that God is seated on that victorious throne over that sin, pain, and death. And like any worship or any relationship to God is in that we can't stay in any place and just have a response. It has to move into a place of intimacy with God. What does it mean to really be with God and be engaging with God in that time of worship? Well, I believe it means that we're transforming our songs just as the lyrics we sing and turning them into that songs from our heart, turning it into the things of our emotions and our minds engage with each and every day. And we just don't say the words passively, but we say them like we mean them. And to begin to prophesy them into the areas of our lives where we want to see things come to pass. Worship begins with response and moves into a place of intimacy. An intimate place where you can just sit at the feet of Jesus and worship Jesus for who Jesus is. So if you've ever spent any time in or around the church, you probably have heard a few of these phrases like, we were created to worship. Worship is a lifestyle. Everyone worships something. The question is, what are you worshiping? How do you worship God when you don't feel like worshiping? What offering are you supposed to give at the end of a long work week? Or when you are feeling uncomfortable when Maybe the church air conditioning isn't working. It's working this morning, thank goodness. <laughs> or when you found out that you didn't get that job that you had been waiting for for months and months. Or when a loved one gets diagnosed with something. How do you worship God when you don't feel like worshiping God at all? We heard in the Hebrew lesson this morning a beautiful picture depicting worship. This woman has come to the end of herself. She's completely broke. And God sends Elijah down to her, and her obedience is not only to the source of that provision, but is that catalyst for that miracle in her own life. There probably aren't many of us who have actually been in this starving widow's shoes, but I think we can draw a few lessons from it as she illustrates how to worship God when you are at the end of your rope. The wind the widow literally had nothing to spare, and yet little that she did have, she gave. Somewhere I think we've gotten into our heads that we're supposed to leave our junk at the door when we come into the church, or that we're supposed to leave our real life out of sight. And our mind comes into worship, but I think that 
we have come farther than the truth. We don't feel like worshiping God because of the mess of our life and yet choose to give God that very mess in act of worship. I think we honor God. The beautiful part that we give that mess in worship, God just doesn't leave it with us. Because as the woman in the story, she gives out of poverty and it acts in that supernatural provision of God. Like when we give God our anxiety and worship, we receive the peace of God. When we lay our burden down at the altar, we receive God's freedom. And when we give our sins to Jesus at the foot of the cross, we receive that righteousness. I can't help but think of the people who have left their messes at the door and walked into the church only to pick up that mess right back when they walk back out. Or the people who bring their mess into church but let it kept them from worshiping God to let them free. You see, Jesus wants you and I to do the best of our parts. He wants all of us. There are times that I believe that we do authentic worship as an outward expression of an inward feeling. It is really easy to let your heart and your hands lead when life is good. And when life is good, you'll jump up and you'll sing and you'll serve and you will let your hands do the worshiping. And honestly, we should because if we don't turn those blessings of God into praise, it ultimately leads into pride. Now, hundreds of years later, Jesus quotes the same passage to the Pharisees, and the Pharisees were some of those most pious people, and they were technically doing all the right things. However, Jesus was calling them out for not being authentic, essentially telling them that they didn't really know who God was. I believe that is a big part of what it means to worship God, is to know God. And if we want to worship God rightly, we need to have the right understanding of who God is. So how do we develop that understanding of God that leads us into that right place of worship? Author and pastor Pastor A.W. Tozer, who I've quoted from before, says, what comes to mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. So the way you think about God is what most defines you. And when you encounter difficult circumstances, leaning in, believing in the God, the goodness of God is a very difficult thing to do. However, regardless of our circumstances, the goodness of God never wavers. In his book, Radical, author and pastor David Platt describes the conversation he had with the religious community leaders on a recent trip that he made abroad. These leaders were from different faith backgrounds, and they were having this conversation about how they thought every religion was fundamentally the same with just minor differences that separated them. After the conversation, the, they asked the author what he thought about it, and he says, it seems like you view life as this mountain and God or whatever you call God is at the top of the mountain and all humanity is at the bottom of the mountain. You make the right one route and then you take the other one but in the end you all end up in the same place. These leaders smiled and responded back is that well you understand well to which the author says well what if I told you that God at the top of the mountain actually came down to meet us where we are at. The leaders paused for a moment and replied, well, that'll be great. So the author concluded with leaning in a little closer and said, let me introduce you to Jesus. Worship is a place where God's people and God's presence connect. And it can happen in any part of our lives from Sunday morning to Saturday night God wants it all. Worship is the place where we can be real with God. It is where all of our masks are stripped away, where our hearts are exposed. Worship is where spirit is surrendered and collides. And worship is where we are made new. 
So I encourage you, as we come to Jesus with everything that we are, the good, the bad, the ugly, that we will find that renewal and rest. And as we go into pride next week, and as we begin going out into the world, sharing who we are, that we are being you. That's why we titled our sermon series, Be You. I wanted to title it Be You at Milwaukee MCC, but it was only fitting that we need to be you no matter where we are. So as we go out into the world this day, and each and every day I bring blessings upon you. Amen.